Hello, my name is Simon Dennis, and I'm going to be presenting work on understanding memory for wear using experience sampling technology. My collaborators were Elizabeth Lelaberte, Adelaide McKenzie, Youngwook Kim, and Ben Stone. This is a pre-recorded presentation for the 2020 meeting of the Society for Mathematical Psychology. In 1984, Ronald Cotton was convicted for two counts of rape and two counts of burglary. He was sentenced to life plus 50 years. Cotton was exonerated in 1995 after spending over 10 years in prison when DNA evidence demonstrated it had been Bobby Poole who had committed the crime. This is a famous case in the memory literature because Jennifer Thompson Canino, the victim, identified Cotton uh, in an original photo lineup but also again in a retrial in 1987. And in this case, uh, Bobby Poole was actually brought into the courtroom along with Cotton and Thompson Canino chose Cotton again. And so this is a classic case of where the choice that people uh, make is actually being entered into memory and is affecting their subsequent um, choices. However, there's another important aspect about this case that is often uh, not highlighted. And that's that Cotton misremembered where he'd been at the, um, at the time of the crime. So he actually identified where he'd been the um, week before the actual crime, as opposed to where he was at the um, time of the crime. And so this false alibi led jurors, jurors to believe that um, he was lying. But how reliably can people remember where they've been? What factors affect this memory? What questions might the detectives have asked to uncover the false memory? Now, unfortunately, our um, current laboratory paradigms really don't prepare us to answer these kinds of questions. So the kinds of factors that we're able to manipulate in the laboratory, like um, font or color or things like that, um, are not really commensurate with the kinds of uh, factors that are important for answering these kinds of questions, like location and, and so forth. So we need to um, look to different methods. So what we did is we endeavoured to collect information about people as they went about their everyday lives. So they carried their um, smartphones with an app um, that you can see on the um, left-hand side here, which recorded their um, movement in the form of accelerometry, where they were in the form of GPS location, and um, the nature of the sound environment. And from these uh, kinds of information, we're able to build a picture of the nature of the experience um, that people uh, had at any given time. So on the right hand side you can see um, pictures of and uh, information that we've put together in the unforgettable system uh, based on the raw information. So we can go ahead and uh, augment that raw information with things like what was the weather like, um, you know, does this audio represent car noise and, and things like that. So in the first experiment what we did is we had uh, subjects go out and collect for a month. And we collected accelerometry vectors 10 times a second continuously. So that um, amounted to about 51 million data points per participant. We collected GPS coordinates every 10 minutes. And so that leads to about uh, 8,640 pairs um, per subject. And we had uh, audio segments. So these were three second segments um, encoded as recorded as uh, null frequency textual coefficients every 10 minutes. There was a one week retention interval and then they received the memory test. Each trial of the memory test involves them selecting from four locations. So these were all locations that they had um, been at at some uh, point in time. And what they were given is the a particular time. So in this case, Thursday morning, 8 a.m. on August 15th and they had to identify which of the four locations they were at. People were accurate about 64% of the time. Now, what we can do, because we have information about um, each of the, uh, the different response options, we can look at the distance between um, those, the correct answer and those options in different spaces. So we can do that in the um, actual GPS locations, but we can also do that in terms of the distance between the audio segments that we um, saw at these different um, locations and the accelerometry patterns that we saw. And then we can enter those into a conditional logit um, model 
to determine the significance of each of the different dimensions um, to the choice behavior. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the GPS location made a, um, had a much larger impact on the choices that people um, made than say the auditory or the accelerometry. So um, if, to, if a distractor was close to the correct um, location, it was more likely that it would be chosen. We also looked at time, and here we did this in two different ways. So the most um, straightforward way is just to look at continuous time and say, you know, how many seconds were there between the correct option and the um, distractor option. Um, so, and we and we did that. Uh, but what we found was that um, categorical time were, um, was a better predictor. So by categorical time, I mean uh, when events were um, similar according to um, the day. Um, and the hour and the week, um, for instance. So in um, the day measure here, for instance, what we would do is we would say that um, two times were the same if they appeared on the same day, even if they appeared on different weeks. For the hour measure, we would say that two um, locations were the same um, if they appeared at the same hour of the day, even if they appeared on different days. And for the week measure, that just indicates um, did these two events appear in the same week or not. And as you can see, um, these were highly um, substantial effects, uh, with the day effect being somewhat um, larger than the other two. And so this is the error that um, Cotton made, where he indicated um, had the, he had the right um, day, but he had the wrong week. So it does seem like that's a, a dominant error that people make. So in the second experiment, what we did is we um, wanted to investigate how do people's emotions affect their, um, the choices that they make. So we had people collect for a 14 day period this time, and we uh, got them to do the same as last time where they uh, carried the unforgettable app and collected the passive data. But in addition, we asked them to collect um, active data, so about their emotions. So this was done using the SEMA3 app, and on eight times each day, they were given, they were queried about 11 distinct emotions and they had to rate to what extent that they are, they are experiencing those emotions at this particular um, time. So in this case, uh, people were accurate 67% uh, of the time. So again, we can apply the conditional logic model and here you can see that um, all of the emotions that we uh, queried were, um, were substantial predictors of which choices would be selected. Um, the positive emotions were slightly more um, uh, substantial than the negative, but all of the emotions had a very significant effect. What we can also do is look at um, the type of emotion and how that influences accuracy. So now we're just doing a standard logistic um, regression. Uh, rather than conditional regression, regression and just saying um, to what extent does that um, experiencing that emotion at the time of encoding influence your subsequent accuracy. And so one of the interesting things here was the difference between negative and positive emotions. So in the memory literature, which is derived primarily from the laboratory, it's the negative emotions that are um, typically found to be um, most substantial. Um, however, in our experiment, we found the opposite. So negative emotions um, did not differ substantially from zero, whereas the um, positive emotions did, and they did so in an interesting way. So we divided the positive um, emotions into higher arousal um, emotions, like excited, versus lower arousal emotions, like content or relaxed. And you can see that there is a um, very substantial positive um, relationship between these um, low arousal emotions and the um, and accuracy. So, um, so that's a little bit surprising. And, and what's perhaps even more surprising is that the high arousal uh, emotions, like excited, show negative relationship with um, arousal. The uh, effect of the um, low arousal positive emotions may be a consequence of the kinds of places where you tend to experience and experience those um, emotions. So it might be, for instance, that you um, feel uh, things like contentment and relaxed at home. Um, at home, 
is a that's a high probability place for you to be, and so therefore there might be a bias towards selecting um, uh, that that location, and so that might be why we see um, that effect. We we still don't know why it would be though that there would be a negative relationship with the um, the uh, higher arousal positive emotions. So in conclusion, after a one to five week retention interval, people are able to identify where they um, were around about two thirds of the time. Uh, that's given four options. Distractors that are similar in location or similar in categorical time are more likely to be chosen and distractors that have similar emotional context are more likely to be chosen as well. Negative emotions at the time of encoding do not predict accuracy but low arousal positive emotions are associated with better accuracy, while high arousal positive emotions are associated with worse, worse accuracy. Thank you very much.